Hello everyone. This is the first in our series of post-coronavirus lectures at Wayne County Community College for Anatomy and Physiology 2 with Dr. Harold. Um, the subject today is Nutrition and Metabolism, which is Chapter 41 from our patent textbook. Nutrition is a really loaded topic, but we're going to stick with pretty much what is in your textbook. Otherwise, it is rife with controversies, and I guarantee you it will be a moving target for your entire career. I'm not telling you anything that you already don't know. I'm sure you've all been out to dinner with your friend who refuses to touch anything that has gluten in it, someone who believes that all sugar is completely, totally harmful to you, and that cholesterol is evil. Um, so we'll examine some of these diets and whether um, all calories contribute equally to making us fat to our adiposity and causing our insulin resistance. We'll also examine some of the diets um, that are recommended for things such as heart disease, like the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet. And um, a little bit, we'll look at some of the conventional wisdom concerning uh, nutrition. Our initial learning objectives We'll be looking at the processes of nutrition and metabolism, in which we will define the terms nutrition and metabolism, and then outline the processes of anabolism and catabolism. Then we will discuss the role of ATP and ATP-ADP cycling and how this is coupled to drive some of the reactions in our body. We will then look at the dietary sources of carbohydrates and our particular focus will be on carbohydrate metabolism, specifically the steps involved in glycolysis and then the tricarboxylic acid cycle and the electron transport chain. This is a difficult area and students often find difficulty with it, but we'll simplify it. And the good news for you is that everything is take home now so um, you won't have to spend any time really memorizing any of this. Just try to gain a pretty good understanding. Nutrition is the process by which a living organism assimilates food and uses it for growth and for replacement of tissues. It is the area of science that examines the nutrients and other substances in food in relation to maintenance, growth, reproduction, health, and disease of an organism. This will include food intake, its absorption, assimilation, biosynthesis, catabolism, and excretion. Malnutrition is when the body does not receive enough nutrients for its proper function. Malnutrition can be due to not having enough food to eat, or not eating enough of the right kinds of foods, or even being unable to utilize the food that one does eat. There are two major classes of nutrients in food, macronutrients and micronutrients. Macro means big, and the macronutrients take their name from the fact that they make up the bulk of the nutrition in the food that we eat. These are the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. These nutrients supply our calories and serve as the building blocks for muscles and tissues. Sometimes water is included with the macronutrients because we need to ingest a large amount of water each day in order to remain healthy. Minerals that we need in large quantities to remain in good health are also often included amongst the mac macronutrients. We call these macro minerals, and these would include sodium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. In comparison, micronutrients are nutrients that we need in very small amounts, such as vitamins and some minerals. The minerals in this group include iron, iodine, zinc, manganese, cobalt, and a few others. These mineral micronutrients are also called microminerals or trace elements. We must also examine whether nutrients are essential nutrients or non-essential nutrients. Essential nutrients are ones that cannot be synthesized by the body and therefore must be supplied from foods. They include the building blocks of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, certain vitamins, 
minerals, and water. Non-essential nutrients can be made by the body or obtained from sources other than foods and beverages. These include biotin that's produced by the gastrointestinal tract bacteria, cholesterol that is produced by the liver, vitamin K that is produced by intestinal bacteria, and vitamin D which we obtain from sunlight. So what then is a balanced diet? Well, in attempts to do that, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, has for some time been producing visual guides to help people make healthful selections. Currently, we use the US Food Guide Plate, or My Plate, which you see here as choosemyplate.gov which shows that people should take a healthy selection of fruits and vegetables being half of the plate, and then a portion of grains that's a little bit larger than protein, and also uh, including dairy. Compare this with the Canadian Eat Well plate. The Canadian Eat Well plate puts half the diet as fruits and vegetables, a larger portion towards grain products and a very small portion toward meat and meat al protein alternatives. They also recommend that the beverage of choice is water or milk and alternatives. The DASH diet, which arose from research sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, stands for Dietary Approaches to stop hypertension. It's a diet that's designed to either help treat or prevent high blood pressure. The DASH diet encourages patients to reduce the sodium in their diets and eat a variety of foods that are rich in nutrients that help lower blood pressure, such as potassium, calcium, and magnesium. It has been shown that by following the DASH diet, patients are able to reduce blood pressure by a few points in just two weeks. Over time, the systolic blood pressure could therefore drop by 8 to 14 points, which is a significant difference in health risk. Because the DASH diet is a healthy way of eating generally, it offers health benefits for conditions other than just blood pressure. The DASH diet is often recommended to prevent osteoporosis, cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. And there are some modifications to the DASH diet. There's like a lower sodium version of the diet um, that cardiologists often recommend for heart patients um, and uh, you know various other uh, forms of the DASH diet that are tailored um, to meet certain patient population needs. You can compare this to the old 1970s food pyramid. Um, the food pyramid was developed in Sweden when um, food prices were high and the Swedes were trying to get uh, people to eat nutritious meals that were not costly. And the USDA ended up adopting the food pyramid and making periodic changes to it. Um, but you can see that it was uh, pretty heavy uh, in the bottom area of carbohydrates and fruit and vegetables were a lesser recommendation in number of servings compared to all the carbo uh, simple carbohydrates of rice and bread and uh, grain alternatives. And now we're finding uh, that we've switched that around. So if we go to the next slide and look at the new food pyramid, the Healthy Eating Pyramid was developed in the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health. And it was devised because they recognized that um, generations of American were used to the iconography of the regular food pyramid, but they wanted to move around the components to what is a more acceptable modern uh, healthy design, basically corresponding to the uh, healthy eating plate. And it is thought that the healthy food pyramid or the new food pyramid should be used as more of a grocery list to correspond to the, to the healthy eating plate. 
and it emphasizes vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, some healthy oils, and healthier proteins like nuts, beans, fish, and chicken. It also addresses other aspects of a healthy lifestyle, such as exercise, weight control, vitamin D, um, which you see down on the bottom or base of the pyramid. Um, so it's thought to be a useful tool for health professionals and health educators. And as I said, as a companion to the healthy eating plate. Maintaining the iconography, um, other diets also use that uh, pyramid. Um, and here you see the ketogenic paleo food pyramid. A keto diet or ketogenic diet is a low carb, moderate protein and higher fat diet that is useful for helping to burn fat more effectively. It has many benefits for weight loss, health, and performance. Thus, it has been adopted by many uh, high caliber athletes such as uh, Tom Brady. Um, it's been uh, shown to help control weight in over 50 studies and that's why it's becoming recommended by so many doctors. A keto diet can be especially useful for losing the excess body fat without hunger. Um, so it tends to be a little bit easier for people to adhere to it. So for patients who failed multiple diets, um, this one tends to be a little bit more effective. Um, it's also useful for those who suffer from seizure disorders and especially for improving uh, type 2 diabetes. As we've discussed many times before, metabolism is all of the chemical reactions in your body taking place all at once. So it is there for both the building up and the breakdown of nutrients within a cell. All these chemical reactions will provide the energy and create the substances that sustain life. It's divided into two parts, catabolism, which breaks down complex molecules and releases energy, therefore it is exergonic, and anabolism, which util utilizes energy and building blocks to build more complicated or complex molecules. Thus, it is endergonic. Catabolism is the release of energy from a set of metabolic pathways, which break down molecules into smaller units including the breaking down and oxidizing of food molecules. An example would be proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and polysaccharides being broken down into smaller molecules like amino acids, nucleotides, fatty acids, and monosaccharides. Its opposite process is anabolism, which combines small molecules into larger molecules. Energy that is released from catabolism will store as ATP within the cell. The cell will then use this source of energy for synthesizing cell components from simple precursors, for the mechanical work of contraction and motion, for transport, transport of substances across its membrane, and the like. In our big picture of metabolism, Remember that metabolism is the sum of all the reactions occurring within a living organism. So all chemical reactions either will require energy or release energy. Metabolism itself is an energy balancing act. Catabolism occurs when the breakdown of complex carbohydrates are made into simpler molecules. Catabolic reactions are the ones that release energy. In anabolism, from our simple compounds, we're building up complex ones. And anabolic reactions are the ones that usually require energy. Catabolism and anabolism are coupled because the catabolic reactions will furnish the energy that is required to drive the anabolic reactions to occur. In other words, catabolic reactions transfer energy from complex molecules to ATP, and anabolic reactions will transfer energy from ATP to complex molecules. So let's look at that now, the role of ATP in metabolism. Adenosine triphosphate, ATP, 
is comprised of the molecule adenosine, represented here by the A box in blue, bound to three phosphate groups, the three Ps in the yellow circles. Adenosine is a nucleoside consisting of the nitrogenous base adenine and the five carbon sugar ribose. The three phosphate groups in order of the closest to the furthest from the ribose sugar are labeled alpha, beta, and gamma. Together, these chemical groups constitute an energy powerhouse. The two bonds between the phosphates are equal high energy bonds called phosphoanhydride bonds that when broken will release sufficient energy to power a variety of cellular reactions. The bond between the beta and gamma phosphate is considered high energy because when that bond breaks, the products, the ADP and the inorganic phosphate, usually represented as a P in a little lowercase i, have lower free energy than the reactants. ATPs break down into ADP and pho inorganic phosphate is called a hydrolysis because it consumes a water molecule. So ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and releases energy that is used to drive cellular processes. And this is important for understanding the ATP ADP cycle. Now textbooks when talking about the ATP ADP cycle are always telling you to think of it as the currency of a cell. But I think it's more like a teller in the bank that takes money from one person and gives it to the next because ATP only exists for a little fleeting moment. It's a highly unstable molecule. It will quickly dissociate into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And so you're quickly passing around this energy from one molecule to the other, breaking and making bonds. To harness the energy within these bonds of ATP, cells use a strategy called energy coupling. Cells couple the exergonic reaction of ATP hydrolysis when the ATP is broken apart by water into ADP and the inorganic phosphate and it gets coupled, that energy, with the endergonic or energy requiring reactions of cellular processes. For example, transmembrane ion pumps in nerve cells will use the energy from ATP to pump the ions across the cell membrane and generate an action potential. Or the sodium potassium pump, that sodium Na plus, K plus, pump that drives sodium out of a cell and potassium into the cell. When ATP is hydrolyzed, it transfers that last phosphate, the gamma phosphate, to the pump protein in a process called phosphorylation. The sodium potassium pump gains the free energy and then it's able to undergo a conformational change that allows it to release three sodium to the outside of the cell and bring two extracellular potassium ions into the cell. By donating free energy to the pump, phosphorylation drives the endergonic reaction. We will soon see in glycolysis that ATP is required for the phosphorylation of glucose, creating a high energy but unstable intermediate that also traps glucose inside of the cell. But let's first examine some of the dietary sources of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are biomolecules that consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, usually with a hydrogen. Carbohydrates are biomolecules consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms usually with a hydrogen to oxygen atom ratio of two to one, just like water. Carbohydrates are found in most of the foods that we eat. Complex carbohydrates, which are polysaccharides, such as starches and vegetables, grains, and other plant tissues, are broken down into simpler carbohydrates before they are absorbed at the brush border. Glucose is the primary source of energy for most living organisms. Cellulose 
is an insoluble polysaccharide. It's found in the cell walls of all plants, and it's one of the main components of insoluble dietary fiber or roughage. Although it is not digestible, insoluble dietary fiber helps to maintain a healthy digestive system by easing defecation. Other polysaccharides contained in dietary fiber include resistant starch and inulin, which feed some bacteria in the microbiome of the large intestine and are metabolized by these bacteria to yield short chain fatty acids. The monosaccharides fructose and galactose are isomers of glucose and they are usually converted to glucose by the liver cells. Although simplified in this diagram, the conversion to glucose requires several steps. Glucose is the carbohydrate that is universally used by all cells in the body. Now, you might recognize this picture from your old uh, Bio 155 textbook. I put this picture in here to remind you as to why we need to go through all these complex food breakdown pathways. As represented in the bottom cartoon, uh, we have a schematic representation of the controlled stepwise oxidation of sugar in a cell compared to ordinary burning, which is the top photograph where you see glucose burning there on a spoon. In the cell, enzymes catalyze oxidation via a series of small steps in which the free energy is transferred in conveniently small sized packets to carrier molecules, which will most often be ATP and NADH. At each step, an enzyme is controlling the reactions by reducing the activation energy barrier that has to be surmounted before specific reactions can occur. The total free energy released is exactly the same in the picture with the spoon at the top and the picture at the bottom in the stepwise fashion. But if the sugar was instead oxidized to carbon dioxide and water in a single step, it would release an amount of energy much larger than could be captured for useful purposes. Okay, so now let's look at these food breakdown pathways. And this is the sort of busy, scary slide that just makes your head want to spin. I know that. So let's take a deep breath and just look at it. Let's we'll start with that nice picture that shows a lovely piece of brie and a nice French bread something that looks like a delicious dessert jelly roll or something up there. Okay, so this is all that great, wonderful food stuff. And all this mixture of proteins, lipids, and polysaccharides, and all that food that we like to eat has to eventually be broken down into smaller molecules before our cells can use them, either as a source of energy or as the building blocks for other molecules. So this breakdown processes must act on the food that is taken in from the outside. And remember, you are that hollow tube, right? So all that internal tube of your elementary canal is still the outside world, okay? And we have to break down all those foods on that outside, but not on the macromolecules that are actually inside of our cell. So first we start the enzymatic breakdown of the food molecules, and that is digestion okay and that's going to occur either in our intestine outside of our cells or in a specialized organelle within the cells called the lysosome where the lysosomal enzyme uh, will break down things and it's separated from the cytosol inside the cells in either case these large polymeric molecules in the food are broken down during digestion into their monomer subunits, the proteins and the amino acids, the polysaccharides into the sugars, and the fats into the fatty acids and glycerol through the action of enzymes. After digestion, the small organic molecules derived from the food will enter the cytosol of the cell. 
where their gradual oxidation begins. Okay, and that's where we're going to begin our carbohydrate breakdown pathways. So overall, our pathway of aerobic respiration is going to take that molecule of glucose, the C6H12O6, in the presence of oxygen, and we're going to have products formed that will be carbon dioxide, our waste product that we blow off in respiration, water, and ATP. We're going to examine the three stages of aerobic respiration that first starts out with glycolysis that breaks down glucose into two, three carbon units of pyruvate. Okay, then we're going to acetylate that and form acetyl-CoA, which enters the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Okay, and that goes into the mitochondrion. And then our final stage will be the electron transfer phosphorylation or electron transport chain. And uh, that's where we make the bulk of our ATP. Okay, so let's look again at this food breakdown pathway and orient ourselves for where we start with all of this. Okay, so first you're going to see we have all of our food stuff outside of that gray cell and it's going to get digested outside of the cell. And then these small organic molecules derived from the food will enter the cytosol. So you see all of that entering into that gray box, which is the cell, entering the cytosol, where their gradual oxidation is going to begin. And the first stage is going to be glycolysis, which will occur out in the cytosol. And then through glycolysis, we form pyruvate. And you see pyruvate is still out there in the cytosol. That will become acetylated and it then enters the mitochondria where we're going to enter into the tricarboxylic acid cycle. See right there in the center. And we're going to come out of there. We're going to be transferring a whole bunch of energy in that cycle into a bunch of coenzymes. We're going to form a small amount of ATP, but most of the energy is going to get transferred to the coenzymes. So we'll keep very good track of those coenzymes in the uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle. And then we're going to take all those coenzymes from the tricarboxylic cycle and transport them into the uh, leaflets of the mitochondria on the mitochondrial membrane. And that's where the electron transport chain is in that uh, uh, green box. And we will then extract the high energy uh, electrons from those coenzymes and make a large amount of ATP. Okay, so let's begin by looking at glucose transport into the cell. Glucose is first taken up by the cell at a glucose transporter. And then a phosphate group is immediately attached to the glucose. This phosphorylation of glucose will trap that glucose inside the cell so that it can't go back out of the transporter. The glucose is phosphorylated by ATP to form glucose 6-phosphate or G6P. And that now bears a charge and it is that charge that disables the G6P from leaving the inside of the cell. Phosphorylation is the process of adding the phosphate group to the glucose molecule. In most cells of the body, glucose phosphorylation is an irreversible reaction. However, in a few cells, uh, particularly those of the intestinal mucosa, the liver, and the kidney cortex, the renal cortex, glucose phosphorylation is reversible. These cells contain a phosphatase, an enzyme that can split the phosphate off from the glucose 6-phosphate. This reverse glucose phosphorylation reaction forms, forms glucose 6-phosphate back to glucose, which then moves out of the cell and into the blood. 
through most other cells, once uh, the glucose is phosphorylated into G6P, it cannot pass through the cell membranes. And thus, the glucose is trapped in the cell and will um, enter glycolysis. Glycolysis is an anaerobic process. It occurs in the cytoplasm of all of our cells. It's the only process that will provide cells with energy in conditions where there is no oxygen. And it breaks down the chemical bonds and glucose molecules and releases about 5% or 5% of the energy that is stored in them. Okay, so let's examine glycolysis. During glycolysis, one six carbon glucose molecule is converted into two molecules of pyruvate, each of which contains three carbon atoms. For each molecule of glucose, we will invest two molecules of ATP that will be hydrolyzed to provide energy to drive the early steps of glycolysis. But during glycolysis, we will produce four molecules of ATP in the later steps. Therefore, we will create a net total of two ATP molecules. Another reaction during glycolysis yields enough energy to convert NAD to NADH, reducing NAD to NADH plus a hydrogen ion. The reduced coenzyme NADH will later be used in the electron transport system and its energy will be released there. So during glycolysis, two NADH molecules are produced. And sometimes when people start examining glycolysis in the tricarboxylic acid cycle, they spend so much time looking at what's happening to the carbon backbone of glucose and the real important thing for you to watch is where you're making your ATP and where you're making these reduced coenzymes that store a lot of energy that will later be used in the mitochondria to create more ATP. So pay more attention to that. We begin our carbohydrate breakdown pathway with the degradation of glucose in a sequence of reactions that occurs out in the cytoplasm known as glycolysis, which takes its name from glucose, the Greek for sweet, and leucis or lysis for rupture. The glucose is broken down into two three carbon units of pyruvate out in the cytoplasm. It will then be acetylated and enter the mitochondria where it will then go through the carboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle, which will again yield another two ATP and will yield several reduced coenzymes. Those reduced coenzymes will then enter the electron transfer phosphorylation chain and we will extract the energy from those reduced coenzymes, regenerating them back to their oxidative form so they can be used again. And we will utilize all that energy to create further ATP.